Um, so our objectives are going to be to discuss the main classes of HIV meds, um, review the mechanism of action, understand um, why we do combination therapy, and also discuss some of the main side effects of the most commonly used HIV medicines. All right, so we're going to start off with a question. Um, how many classes of HIV meds are there today? So any takers for three? No? Good. Um, what about four? No? All right, five? Okay. <laughs> how about six? All right, I, I'm going to give you guys this one. Um, five or six is debatable because um, sometimes we group one of the classes, one of the two classes in one. Um, but the answer technically would be six, okay? Um, and I think most of you were kind of lumping these two into one class. Um, but what we use pretty heavily are combinations with NRTI, so th those work with the nucleoside reverse transcriptase, right? And you have non nucleosides protease inhibitors, and integrase inhibitors, all right? And, of course, your entry infusion inhibitors. So let's walk you guys through how these medicines work. So here's our HIV life cycle, right? So if you look at where the virion is coming in, it's going to attach, and you may or may not see these little um, receptors here. There are actually two receptors there, GP120 and GP41. Um, that's what the virion is going to use to attach to the cell. And it can use a couple of different receptors to attach. So one is CCR5, and the other is called CXCR4. So we do have a CCR5 inhibitor, right? That's the one you saw in the previous slide. So once you have attachment of the cell, you're also going to then have your fusion. And you have a fusion inhibitor, right? And now you're going to have release of that material into um, the host cell. Now, here is where your reverse transcriptase is going to work, right? So it's going to help you make DNA from RNA, right? So that's why it's called reverse transcription. So this is the point where our NRTIs and our NNRTIs are going to work. Once you have viral DNA form, what's going to happen? These guys here have to be integrated into the host DNA. And which enzyme does the integration? No brainer, right? It's the integrase. And this is where our integrase inhibitors work. They block this step. Now, once your transcription continues, you are going to have um, formation of proteins via translation, and you're going to have these long strands of protein. Now, for them to be active proteins, um, you're going to have something to break them up or cleave them into little pieces. And the enzyme that does this is the protease. So without the protease, you cannot continue to have those active strands of proteins, and you're not going to have your budding or your maturation. So you can imagine that that's where your protease inhibitors work. So this, in a nutshell, is where our meds work, right? Our entry inhibitors here in attachment our fusion inhibitor, we only have one of each, our fusion inhibitor here, our NRTIs and NNRTIs here, our integrase here, and our protease inhibitors at this later step, okay? And this is our most current arsenal of all our HIV meds um, that we have available to us today. Um, just so you have a visual, um, so you can see a lot of meds today. And I like this slide because it is the most updated because um, for those who have rotated with me before in the 550 clinic, um, till very recently we had four once-a-day options, and now we have the newest once-a-day option in here called Gemboya. And so you can also see that we have some um, medications in a class. It's not a real class of medications, but a group called, here it's fancily called pharmacokinetic enhancer, and you have your ritonavir and your cobicistat. And we'll go through this as we go through some questions, okay? But just so you know, we have a big arsenal at our disposal, and a lot of times you guys will talk about heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy. For me today, all of them work as a highly active drug, so you'll see me say ART more frequently. But I don't really care what you call it, as long as you know we have all these guys here available for you. All right, so let's talk about how we combine the drugs. So which combination of ARV or ART 
would not be recommended for a treatment-naive patient. And treatment-naive is somebody who's never been on any HIV meds before. Do you guys th think we should do two NRTIs with one integrase, two NRTIs with one boosted PI, or one NRTI and two PIs, which is not what you would, would do in real life? A, B, or C? Okay, I see people saying C. So yes, that is C. I made this one easy. So typically you don't use two PIs, right? So PIs um, are very potent drugs, but the problem with them is that they also have a lot of side effects. So if you're going to add two PIs plus a booster, that's not going to be well tolerated, and you're going to have a ton of interactions with other drugs. So the principle of it, though, is, is, is correct, right? So how many drugs do we currently use to treat HIV? I heard somebody say three. Okay, so three active drugs, right? And again, I, I want to say that um, this was through studies that they figured out that you needed three active drugs, but I will say that in today's day and age where we have these very potent drugs, we're even considering taking a step back and trying to see, see if some of the newer drugs we can do dual drug therapy, but again, that's in studies. It's not out there yet. So for now, we will use three active drugs to, to treat HIV, okay? And so basically, when you talk about HIV drug therapy, you usually talk about a backbone and a base. Um, your backbone is typically going to be a combination of two nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and then your base will be either an integrase inhibitor or a protease inhibitor. Now, these are the recommendations for um, treatment-naive patients, okay? Till last year, we had an NNRTI in here, but the most current guidelines suggest this plus one of these guys. And there's five regimens that we use for treatment-naive patients. Of course, if it's not a treatment-naive patient, or even if it is, depending on certain parameters, it's not wrong to do this guy in here, okay? But we'll go through that as well. So and I don't know how much you can see here, but... There are five regimens, right? And of the five, four of them have an integrase inhibitor as a base. So those are our newest kids on the block. There are our very um, potent and fast-acting drugs, okay? And so this recommendation for these five regimens, so they've, before it used to be seven regimens recommended, they've simplified that a lot. Um, and so these are, there's only one PI-based regimen here, and all the others have integrases in them, okay? And then, of course, if you go to your second-tier options, that's when you see your non-nucleosides in here. And the reason is, like, some of the non-nucleosides, like rupivirine, it's not as effective. So if you have a viral load that's very high or a CD4 that's very, you know, like a viral load that's high, you don't want to use those drugs, okay? So, and then here you see combinations of medications. So any... Uh, patient, you got to look at their specific situation. They may have drug interactions. They may not tolerate certain drugs. So therefore, you need to be careful. You, you need to not be stuck on, oh, there's only five regimens I can use. You can mix and match, but just keep in mind what's going on with your patient, okay? And then here are other regimen options. Like I was saying, you can mix and match different things depending on patient situation, all right? If you imagine we have 25 plus drugs for HIV, we're going to have a lot of combinations, right? All right, now let's go into some um, classic side effects. Which ART class is classically associated with lactic acidosis? Is it the PIs, the NRTIs, the non nukes, or the integrase inhibitors? Any votes for A? Nobody? Okay, what about B? Nobody. How about C? And what about the integrases? Okay. All right, guys. So this one, nobody wanted to answer or didn't know, <laughs> but the answer is actually NRTIs. So let's walk you through this, okay? So NRTIs um, are, are known for having mitochondrial toxicity, okay? They interfere with a bunch of different pathways in this cycle, and that's why there's a potential for lactic acidosis. 
However, with the newer drugs we use today, this is not so much of a risk. There's a theoretical risk for the class. However, the ones we use today, I haven't come across this in forever, okay? But let's walk you through this. So your NRTIs, they block beta oxidation. So instead of having this going into this path, pathway with free fatty acids and then joining this whole cycle here, you're actually going to have accumulation of triglycerides, right? It also blocks the Krebs cycle and DNA gamma polymerase. So you're going to mess up this whole cycle in the mitochondria, okay? And as a result, instead of going every, all the byproducts going this way, you're going to divert things to form lactate, so lactic acid. And what are the symptoms of this? Um, with the older NRTIs, it would be very vague. So some vague nausea and just malaise and abdominal pain. There was nothing that would scream at you, oh, this person has lactic acidosis. So you just had to have that in the back of your mind when you just couldn't put a finger on it. Like another way to, to look at it is to maybe check a lactic acid if you're suspected, um, and it's, it's mainly a hunch. Again, today, you're not going to come across this so much, but we do have some patients who are still on old regimens just because they didn't want to switch the new ones. Um, so keep that in mind for those cases, or call us in the 550 clinic if you're in doubt. Um, all right, so now which class of ART can be associated with metabolic syndrome and fat redistribution. Actually, which class is? All right. Do you guys think it's integrases with PIs? Is it the PIs and entry inhibitors? Is it the NRTIs and PIs? Or you think none of these really um, cause metabolic syndrome and fat redistribution? Who's for A? Mm, nobody. Okay. Who's for PIs and entry inhibitors? Okay, I see a lot of people like, ah, oh, I don't know. Uh, what about NRTIs and TIs? All right, good. And anybody for D? <laughs> All right, no. Okay, so a lot of people on this side of the room um, have the right answer. So these are NRTIs and PIs, and let's walk you through this. Um, so the ARTs, both the PIs and the NRTIs, um, have an impact on insulin resistance. Um, especially the PIs are not um, in, a, in metabolic syndrome. The PIs are not the most lipid-friendly drugs. However, both of these can cause um, fat redistribution, and by that I mean you have an increase in visceral fat and decrease in subcutaneous fat. So you have those folks with like a real big belly and those little spindly arms and legs. That's kind of what you see. Um, and some of that has to do, again, with mitochondrial toxicity. Um, so you see that. Um, and then you also have patient-related factors. So diet and environment and genetics will also contribute to that. And then other things, age, uh, hepatitis C co-infection, low testosterone will contribute to that. Then, of course, HIV is an inflammatory um, syndrome, right? You have cytokines, and that will also impact this and this. And ultimately, you're going to have de decreased glucose tolerance or even diabetes, dyslipidemia. Um, so, and of course, if you have metabolic syndrome, you have a higher risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and at, at one point in time, some of the NNRTIs were thought to actually be a cause for increased heart attacks. But when they actually looked into this and studied it further, they didn't find a causation. But of course, if you already have high cholesterol and you already have um, heart disease and you already have diabetes, all those things together are going to contribute to this picture. Okay. All right. So which of the HIV meds require boosting or the use of those fancy, like that fancy group we talked about, pharmacokinetic enhancers? So NNRTIs, NRTIs, or PIs in one of the integrase inhibitors. Anyone for A? What about B? Okay, and C. All right, very good. So today there are two boosters. Um, one is older. We know about this one for quite a while. It's called Ritonavir, or Norvir is the branding. And then Cobicistat, or Tybost, is the, is the newer um, enhancer. I'm just going to call them boosters. But So what's the principle behind this? 
So ritonavir actually has its own HIV activity, right? And it was used as its own drug as part of a regimen for in the old, olden days. Um, but you needed a very high dose of ritonavir. So we're talking about handfuls of pills. The other downside to ritonavir is that it is not well-tolerated GI-wise at all. So a lot of nausea, vomiting, bloating, diarrhea. So eventually, since it is an inhibitor of hepatic microsomal enzyme, CYP453A4, say that three times fast, um, it will allow another PI to hang around for longer, and you can use that other PI, which you're using as the active drug, at a lower dose. So less side effects, less pill burden, and lower dose, so better tolerated. So then through studies, we came up with this idea of combining two PIs, one being the booster and the other being the active drug. Um, and so that is the principle be, be, uh, behind ritonavir. In more recent years, probably a couple years ago, you had cobicistat come around. This was originally used to be a booster for the integrase inhibitor L-vitegravir. For those who have rotated in clinic or who know the name Stribild, that is the integrase inhibitor that is in Stribild, one pill once a day. And so the problem with L-vitegravir is that it just couldn't hang around long enough. It was metabolized very quickly, but it was a once-a-day integrase inhibitor, right? So, and we didn't have any once-a-days um, back then. So then they came up with the idea of uh, formulating this booster in order to help this hang around longer, and therefore you could have a once-a-day integrase inhibitor. Cobicistat does not have any HIV activity of its own. It is simply a booster. And now it's very exciting to see that they have this in combination with PIs, darunavir and adizanavir, because after all, the, the, the principle is the same, okay, the same principle. And this now comes in a one pill, because darunavir does not come in one pill with ritonavir, and neither does adizanavir. So we're adding an extra pill. Even though those are once-a-day drugs, there was an extra pill burden. So that's very exciting to us to allow us to switch that and potentially not have as many of the GI side effects that ritonavir has. So in clinic, we've been trying to switch our patients who were on boosted um, darunavir or adizanavir with ritonavir to this combo here. And we have seen a lot of people who had diarrhea for years, but they're like, well, this regimen's working for me. And now they're able to have one less pill and less diarrhea. So that's, that's really cool to see. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, this one's a basic one, and most of you will know this one. When should you start ARVs in the outpatient setting? Upon diagnosis, you monitor CD4 count and start when the CD4 is less than 350. You monitor CD4 count and start when it's less than 500. And, or you don't really need to start it unless the patient's pregnant, has kidney disease, um, so AIDS-associated nephropathy, right? or HIV-associated nephropathy, or an AIDS-defining illness. Who votes for A? Okay, how about B? Okay, and C? Okay, and what about D? Okay, good. All right, uh, there was a split room there. Um, for those of you who have rotated in clinic, you know that the answer should be upon diagnosis, right? So this has changed. This has changed as of probably 2012. So before, when I was training as a fellow, um, we were probably right around here. First it was th this, and then it went to this. So why is it that there were these cutoffs before? So the cutoffs was, were mainly based on drug toxicities, and cost, okay? So um, in, a, in a lot of areas that are considered resource-poor settings, you don't have access to some of the newer drugs that we have access to. So toxicity was a big limiting factor. The other problem um, was, of course, um, cost, right? And so that is why you would defer therapy, because you didn't want to start people on something if it was going to be really expensive and you were going to feel sick as a dog taking it, right? Now the situation has changed. We are, our newer medicines are very well tolerated, so we don't have that limitation anymore. And that's why in 2012, DHHS um, guidelines went ahead and changed for us here in the U.S. So as of 2012, in our clinic at least, we've been starting... Um, 
ART on everybody independently of their CD4 count, okay? And then uh, for a while, um, the, w, uh, the World Health Organization had not joined those recommendations quite yet because of what? Resource-poor settings not having access. But that is less of a problem today. So actually, they have joined these recommendations as of last year. And the IAS USA joined these recommendations as of 2014. So for today, we start at any time. It doesn't matter if your CD4 count is 1,000 or if your CD4 count is 150. You're going to start meds at any time. And again, I'm talking about the outpatient setting, okay, because there are some instances um, when you have a very sick patient in the hospital and they have an active opportunistic infection, and you may have to delay your uh, ART a little bit so you don't run into the risk of um, inflam uh, immune reconstitution, inflammatory syndrome. That's a whole other topic. It would take hours to explore that. But I am talking about the outpatient setting. Person comes to your clinic. It doesn't matter what their CD4 count is. You're going to offer them treatment. Okay? All right. Let's go into this one. Those of you who... Rotate at the 550, know this one. Um, you have an HIV-positive patient, and you're considering starting a back of ear, which is an NRTI. What sh should you do prior to starting the back of ear? No concerns. Just go ahead and start. Check some basic labs, um, CBC and CMP, or you should be concerned about a hypersensitivity reaction. So you have to check HLAB5701. So which one do you guys think? A, anybody for A? And B, okay, what about C? All right, okay, I had a split room. Um, I had people between B and C. So the actual answer is you should be concerned about hypersensitivity reaction, and you check this gene test called HLA-B5701. So when a back of ear first started being used, they started noticing people who, some people who would take it and have this big hypersensitivity reaction. And upon rechallenge, they would notice that it would be even worse. So that was a bad outcome. So they studied that reaction and actually looked for any predisposing factors. And that's how they came across that people who had this HLA-B5701 gene positive were prone to having this reaction. Um, so therefore, for us today, before we start anybody on a, a back of ear containing regimen, we are going to check this. And because now a back of ear is part of a once a day regimen called Triumec, it's stepped up its game. So we are doing this at baseline in clinic before you know we even start meds. We right off the bat are ordering this because we have a once a day regimen that contains this. Um, and it, so you know once a day is, is prime time here. So we need to give those medicines a priority. Um, so what happens with this reaction? So vague symptoms, fever, <coughs> malaise, GI disturbance, but one-third can uh, evolve to cough, dyspnea, and bronchospasm, all right? Rash is actually a late symptom, and about 30% can have no rash, okay? But on rechallenge, you can have hypotension and tachycardia, so you don't really want to rechallenge these people, okay? All right, let's go to the next one. You have a patient on, um, on meds and that contain the NRTI tenofovir. He has been compliant with medication and virologically suppressed. On annual UA, you notice glycosuria. He is not a diabetic. You also notice some proteinuria and increased creatinine. What should you be concerned about? Nephrolithiasis, Fanconi syndrome, or HIV-associated nephropathy. Anybody for A? Okay, what about B, Fanconi? Okay, um, and what about HIV-associated nephropathy? Okay, good. I see, I, I, yeah, I see some people who rotated with me and some people who are going into nephrology who knew the answer. So this is Fanconi. All right, so this is a rare side effect of tenofovir. For those who are not very familiar with HIV meds, tenofovir is something we use pretty heavily in our regimens. Um, so this is a rare side effect, but it's something you have to be aware of. So what characterizes this Fanconi syndrome? So it's this constellation of increased creatinine, glycosuria, hypophosphatemia, and ATN. 
So when you do have this, you must stop the drug, okay? Um, and we come across this because we do annual UAs or sometimes more frequent, especially for that, because a lot of our regimens contain tenofovir. We want to keep an eye on that. And every couple of years, we have a Fanconi's in clinic. Um, we had one last year, I want to say. Um, so basically what happens is tenofovir, again, is an NRTI, right? causes mitochondrial toxicity, so you have an energy imbalance, and you're going to mess up your sodium phosphate receptors here, which then, instead of absorbing those, you're going to waste those. So you're going to waste mostly phosphate and glucose, and that is the mechanism. So it's a wasting syndrome, okay? Now, more recently, we have a new formulation of tenofovir called TAF, and that is, that is the form of tenofovir that it's in the new once-a-day pill called Genvoya. So this formulation is supposed to have a very high intracellular concentration and not so much systemic. So you're supposed to bypass the risks for renal insufficiency and for toxicity, okay? So that's, that's just something very new that's come out recently. Okay, what about this guy? You have a patient that's under runavir, boosted with ritonavir. He's been compliant for several years. He comes in for his routine follow-up, and you know a cushion goid facies. What is the most likely thing to have happened with this patient? So one, a drug interaction between ritonavir and a new statin prescribed by a PCP. Number two, a drug interaction between ritonavir and a new inhaled steroid prescribed by the PCP. Or this is a pituitary tumor and has nothing to do with drug interactions, or a drug interaction between ritonavir and a PPI that the patient's on. Who thinks it's A? No. Okay, who thinks it's B? All right, people are studying HIV meds. Good. Uh, what about C and D? Anybody for these guys? Okay, well, I already gave you the answer, so. All right, so the answer to this is actually B. So that's why it's so important as primary, if you're going to be primary care physician, you're going to be seeing these patients, be very careful when you're adding something onto their regimen because of interactions. So if you're in doubt, just let us know. Call us, call our pharmacist, we'll figure it out. And a lot of times we tell the patient, when you start new meds with anybody, make sure you let us know because sometimes people are not aware of this because if you think about it, it's an inhaled steroid, right? Technically, it shouldn't be a big deal. I mean, everybody goes out there and does inhaled steroid for whatever, right? Uh, however, remember how ritonavir is that potent inhibitor of that microsomal enzyme, right, in the liver? So what it does is it's obviously going to increase the levels of so several other medications, including that's why we use it to boost. But for inhaled steroids um, or steroids in general, it actually causes a 350-fold increase in the level of steroid that reaches systemic concentration. So this is a big increase. So every so often we have folks walking in and their face is like this, and you're like, what, what's going on, you know? And they're like, oh, no, I'm fine. I was having this little asthma or my COPD or whatever, and then I got this purple whatever, this purple disc, and then you're like, oh, okay, well. So... That is why please check, double check, and triple check for interactions, especially with the PIs, especially with the boosted regimen, okay? And the reason I put this one here on the bottom is because there was an option there talking about interaction with the PPI, like what's that about? So adazanavir is, is one of the PIs we use quite a lot, and it's the only one that needs an acidic environment to be absorbed. So if you're on adazanavir, um, you do not want to have a PPI on board. So if it's somebody who has bad GERD and they're going to be on PPI, that regimen is going to fail if you use adazanavir. And that's why you also have to know that because a lot of our folks can get what over the counter? They can get omeprazole over the counter, right? So you have to counsel them. If you have heartburn, let, let me know whatever you're getting over the counter because you can tell them then, but they might not remember, you know? So you have to emphasize that to the patient because now with especially I think even like Flonase and Nasacort you can get over the counter now too so it's very important to emphasize please tell me what you're taking even the over-the-counter stuff all right what about this one 
you have a patient who's on an ARV regimen containing a boost, boosted atazanamide, right? She had come for routine follow-up earlier in the week. When you review her labs, you notice her total billy is up to four, mostly indirect billy. She was completely asymptomatic during her visit and very compliant with her ARV. In, re in retrospect, remembering, you're like, oh, maybe she looked a little yellow. I'm not sure. So what should you do next? Should you pursue a full workup for hepatic biliary disease and refer to GI and discontinue current ARV? Or should you make sure all other liver enzymes are normal and confirm with the patient she's indeed, indeed asymptomatic? If so, don't worry. This is completely fine. So who's for A? Okay, who's for B? Okay, very good. So, okay, so let's go into this a little bit. So, the answer is B because adizanavir actually has um, a benign side effect, which is the increase in, in indirect billy. So, why does that happen? So, you can see here that adizanavir and an older PI, which is indinavir, um, what they do, if you, if you imagine that you have heme coming in here, you have bilirubin, which are, together with glucuronic acid is going to be um, transformed into conjugated bilirubin via this enzyme here called uridine glucuron glucuronyl transferase, however you say it. So these drugs here, they actually inhibit the activity of this enzyme. So what's going to happen is you're not going to conjugate your billy, right? So you're going to have a little accumulation of billy here. So that is why, uh, that's how adizanavir works. And so it, it's benign. It's nothing, if they're asymptomatic, it's more cosmetic effects. So you really have to ask the patient if they don't tell you, oh, my eyes are yellow and I don't like this med. Otherwise, if all the other LFTs are fine, they're asymptomatic, they don't mind the little yellow there, then that's fine. You don't have to change your regimen. Um, I've seen these billies go even up to nine, um, and they're asymptomatic. And But when they're up to nine, you have a pretty yellow hue to your eye, and most people are like, oh, I don't want to be on this, because everyone's like, oh, why are your eyes yellow? So um, this is benign, okay? All right, and let's go into the next one. So you have a patient who's very compliant with ARV, and again, they're on adazanavir because that's my favorite drug of all time, and it's boosted. Um, he has been on this regimen for several years. You note hematuria on his annual UA. You ask him about it, and he mentioned he's following with urology for these recurrent kidney stones. What is your next step in management? Discontinue adazanavir and await stone analysis. Let urology proceed with their workup and make no further changes. And... Ah, this is not an issue with the newer drugs, only with the older drugs. Um, what about A, anybody? B? Okay. Half a person, okay. And what about C? Anybody? Okay. All right, so this is a good question because adizanavir, although notoriously indinavir is what we all talk about, indinavir, sequinavir, right, the, oh, these cause kidney stones. Of the newer generation of drugs, adizanavir actually can induce uh, kidney stones because 7% of drug is excreted unchanged in the urine. So this is a crystal-induced uropathy, and you can precipitate kidney stones. And the actual stone, you can find drug in the stone. You can either find adizanavir crystals sometimes in the urine, but you can actually see drug in the stone. So that's why you would kind of wait for the stone analysis. And actually, that's a real case. I had an actual patient that presented just like that. Oh, I'm fine. I'm doing great. Numbers were good. And I'm like, oh, there's blood in your urine. Oh, yeah, I've been having these kidney stones. I'm like, uh, I, th I think that's not doing fine if you're having a kidney stone every other week. Um, so... So what you have to advise patients that are on adizanavir is that you need to have good fluid intake. You try to push the one and a half liters a day, but good luck with that. You know, at least try to tell them to drink more fluids. And, of course, it is a side effect of indinavir, which is rarely used today. Darunavir, which is the other PI we use pretty heavily, seems to be less... Um, 
you know, less capable of doing this. So the risk with darunavir is much less than with atazanavir. And they actually try to compare the two drugs, and the incidence of kidney stones with darunavir was way lower than with atazanavir. So though there's a theoretical risk, this is not what I traditionally think of as causing kidney stones, okay? Um, and, and this is actually... Uh, uh, case report where these these stones are 100% atazanavir. That's all that was in the stone. So just so you have a vivid image of what this drug can do and to just keep an eye out for it because oftentimes I have patients who um, not really minimize but, but they kind of ignore things even though to you it would be very significant. If you don't ask them, sometimes they're not going to tell you and you have this ample experience in this doing primary care as well.